minimally conscious. The diagnosis given by doctors for Hassan Rasuli, a Toronto patient who's been in a coma for more than two years. The country's Supreme Court is currently hearing arguments in the Rasuli case and how it rules could be groundbreaking for the medical system and end-of-life care. To help us understand more about vegetative states and what we know about consciousness, here's Adrian Owen, Canada Excellence Research Chair in Cognitive Neuroscience and Imaging at Western University in London, Ontario. It's good to have you back in our studio. Thank you very much. Wearing that pin. That's right. Which my, means? My Canada Excellence Research Chair pin. How many people in Canada have one of those? Uh, 19 currently. There are, they are about to award another 10, but it's 19 you're, right now. You're in pretty select company there. Good. Let's start with the Rasuli case, which I just mentioned. It, it is currently in front of the Supreme Court. Give us the background into that before we go further. Uh, well, this patient is, is now thought to be in a minimally conscious state, and that's a, that's a very broad category of patients. It means that there is some evidence that he has residual cognitive awareness, uh, but not enough for him to be able to communicate on a regular basis. So it's, it's somewhere a little better, if you like, than the vegetative state, but uh, he, he's still very severely impaired. It's not much better. He lifted a thumb, I gather, was... That's, that's the evidence of his minimally conscious state. Well, that's right, and this distinction between vegetative and minimally conscious, it, it, it's an extremely slim difference in, in many cases. It can be just the difference between a, you know, a single movement. Um, but that suggests there's some life there. If he's it lifting does, thumb. it does, but you know, in research over the last few years has shown that it's very often the case that uh, these patients are uh, incorrectly diagnosed in the sense that there, are, that there are residual abilities that we are just not able to detect at the bedside. So in fact, many patients who we previously thought were entirely vegetative turn out to have some, some level of, of internal awareness. Now this is a case where the family acting, they say, in his interests, want to keep him quote unquote alive, lying there in a hospital bed at Sunnybrook Hospital, uh, you know, tubes coming in and out of him and so on, and the hospital has in its wisdom decided that they can't do anything else for him and they want to just take, him, take all the tubes out and let nature take its course. Is the distinction that you just made minimally conscious versus persisted vegetative state, is that a significant enough difference to say to the family, okay, we'll do it your way, in the view of medicine? Well, I think in, in, uh, in general, one has to really look at each case individually because these patients are all different. The, the nature of their injuries is different. What they can and they can't do is different. And very often, there are things that we can only discover using techniques that aren't available to general medicine. And that's where, we, where research comes in. So I don't think you can answer it as simply as saying vegetative patients are in one category and minimally conscious patients are in another because you know, it's a very fine line between the two. Okay, fair enough. But do, do, do you and your team have personal involvement with the Rasuli case? Uh, he has been entered into one of our research uh, trials, but for ethical reasons, I, c I can't discuss the results of that. Okay. Can you tell us, there's somebody else who's in a similar situation, I gather, named Scott Routley. Can you tell us about that case? Of course. And, um, I mean, Scott Routley and his family, we've been working very closely together um, to try and understand more about uh, Scott's uh, St Scott situation. In fact, the cases are completely different. I think comparing the two illustrates why it's so important to take each case um, on, you know, on, its, on its own merits, as it were. What are Scott's particulars? So, so Scott was a traumatic brain injury. He had been involved in a vehicle accident 12 um, years ago. Unlike Rasuli, who picked up a virus while he was in the hospital. That's right. Now and that's what happened yes, to him. Yes, now there's a difference between those two categories of patients. The, the prospects of, in, of improvement, the possibility that we might detect residual consciousness is better in traumatic brain injury than in so-called non-traumatic brain injury. I so there's, there's one difference between the two. Uh, also, Scott has been in this situation for a very long time. That's why our findings with him, I think, were so surprising, the fact that brain imaging was able to pick up clear evidence that he was conscious and that he was able to answer questions that, that we put to him. Um, that's, in, in our hands, has, has occurred much less commonly in patients who've, who have a non-traumatic brain injury. This tends to be more the case in patients who've been involved in vehicle accidents or have had blows to the head. I'm going to use a four-letter F word with you right now, okay? Go but it's ahead. not the one that everybody thinks. We all know what an MRI is, magnetic resonance imager. You use an F MRI, functional magnetic resonance imaging, to communicate with these patients who are otherwise completely incapable of communicating. What does this technology allow you to do? 
it's, it's a version of MRI, which most people will be familiar with. Um, functional uh, MRI means that we measure, we look at the flow of blood around, around the brain. We look at how blood is delivered to parts of the brain. And in that way, we're able to uh, understand a little bit more, more about which parts of the brain are functioning normally and which may be functioning abnormally. The specific way that we use it is to get people to respond to commands using just their brain. So using the fMRI machine, we are able to detect when somebody is imagining something that we ask them to imagine. And that's because we hypothesize that these patients are, are physically incapable of responding. They're in some senses locked into their bodies. Mm -hmm. Because they can't physically respond, because they can't squeeze a hand when we ask them or raise their arm to indicate that they're aware, we ask them to imagine during certain scenarios and we can detect whether or not they're doing it and that is our, our marker of consciousness. In fact, you're imagining, you're telling them to imagine playing tennis. That's right. Why, why tennis? Well, it's not that there's a, a tennis playing area of the brain, it's that we're trying to get them to imagine making vigorous arm movements and we need something that's very simple that, that everybody understands and it turns out that you don't have to be an expert in tennis, you don't have to have even played tennis before, you need to just know the basic principles that involves moving your arm around and, and hitting a ball. And that's enough to activate an area known as the premotor cortex at the front and the top of the brain. And in, in healthy participants, this is just as reliable as asking somebody to squeeze your hand. Instead of squeezing your hand, we say, imagine playing tennis and this area activates. Have you done this with Scott? We have done it with Scott. You've asked him to imagine playing tennis? Absolutely. And, and what it was, happened? It was tremendously successful. Now, Scott is a, a, a patient who we, were, we had been unable to elicit responses from him systematically over uh, many months of, of repeated observations. But when we put him in the scanner, we asked him to imagine playing tennis. The premotor cortex of his brain activated very similarly to a healthy, awake individual. And therefore that told you what? It told us that he can command follow, which is the critical clinical marker of consciousness. We asked him to do something and he could do it. That means he, he understood the instruction and he was able to turn that instruction into an action. In fact, he was, he was able to push it even further than that and use it to actually answer questions that we asked him. Like what? Well, we began with very simple things that we knew the answers to just to verify that the system was working. So we asked him if his name was Scott and we said, well, imagine playing tennis if the answer is yes. Imagine doing a different scenario. We asked him to imagine, uh, to imagine walking from room to room in his house because that activates a different network of brain regions. If you want to say no, imagine walking around your house. If you want to say yes, imagine playing tennis. He told us his name's Scott. His name isn't Mike. It's the year is... 2012, that's, that's when we scanned him. It isn't 1999, that's closer to the point of his injury. So this is just to verify that we had this two-way communication. He could answer simple questions. And at that point, we moved on to, to questions that we actually couldn't verify the answer in any other way. He was able to tell us some things about his situation that we had no other way of knowing. Uh, could he tell you whether he was in pain? So that was the first question that we asked him because it, it's something that's, that's clinically extremely important. Um, fortunately, I'm very relieved to say that the answer was no. On two occasions, he's reported that he isn't in any physical pain. Now, I'm going to follow up again. How, how do you know that just because a certain area of the brain lit up, that's a yes or a no? Well, just imagine um, if, if all that was wrong with a patient was that they, they couldn't speak. And we said, well, you know, squeeze your left hand for a yes, squeeze your right hand for a no, and then you would ask, are you in pain? And you've got a right hand squeeze. Now, you would probably want to repeat it a few times to make absolutely sure that it was reliable, but if somebody squeezed their right, hands, their right hand 10 times in a row to say, no, I'm not in pain, I think you'd start to believe it, even though the person couldn't speak. We use exactly the same principle, with, but with brain imaging. We say, well, imagine this task, which will activate one part of your brain for a yes, and another task, which will activate another part of your brain for a no. And of course, just as you would do with hand squeezing, we repeat the study over and over again to make absolutely sure that it's, it's repeatable and it's reliable and the patient really is communicating with us, but they're, they're doing it by systematically activating different areas of their brain rather than squeezing either of their hands. How many patients have you done that with? Um, we've done it in, I would say, probably more than, more than 30 patients now over the, <laughs> last, uh, over the last few years. All at Western in London? 
Uh, no, we've actually tried it in 12 patients at Western. Um, since, okay. I, since I moved to Canada, we've, we've tried this in 12 patients, but we're, we're very happy to try it in, in many more because I think it's, it's a, it's a, it, it is revealing some extremely interesting information about this population of patients. This is fascinating, and I'm sure from your standpoint, exciting as hell to be able to see this kind of progress in the work that you've devoted your life to. Uh, but let me ask a mundane question here. How is this relevant to your patient's care and potential recovery? Well, I think our, uh, this is really where, where we're pushing things now, which is that um, we can start to ask therapeutically uh, relevant questions. When I met you last, we, we had never asked a patient whether they were in pain. We'd, we'd only got as far as establishing that patients, some of these patients are conscious and trying to set up a simple line of communication. We're now starting to probe much more important things like, are you in pain? And um, can any of these patients, you know, are they, is their internal situation or their level of consciousness sufficient for them to make complicated decisions that might be relevant to their ongoing treatment? Can they decide what treatment they would like to try and what, I mean, the, you know, what they don't, the, there is no, I should add, there is no, no treatment for the vegetative state mm -hmm. right now, but of course there are things that we can try to in, improve their lives. And the important thing I think is that some of these patients can now contribute to that decision-making process. They can, they can have an opinion about, um, about you know, what, their, what their future might be. How about your findings in terms of their relevance to the families of these patients? How's that working? I think that's extremely important too, and that's something that's, uh, that I've been exploring <coughs> very much since I arrived in Canada, trying to spend more time with the families and realizing that you know, these, uh, these situations impact upon many people other than the patient. I mean, typically, patients', are, uh, patients families are, are relieved to know more about the situation that their, their relative is in, to know whether there is any residual consciousness. They, they often would like to know whether the patient understands what is being said to them. Are they aware of things that have happened to them since their injury? We recently had, had a patient who was able to report that he did know that his sister had had a baby since his accident, which is something that the family didn't know, but they were relieved, I believe, to know that uh, he was aware that that had occurred. Let me come back to the Rasuli case. He's, he's uh, I think, originally from Iran. That's right, yeah. Do you know if he speaks English? Uh, in fact, I do know that he has some English, but uh, the tests that were conducted on him were done in Farsi. Yes. They were, okay. I wondered about that. Now, obviously, with the case before the Supreme Court right now, and the family's interest and the hospital's interest being quite polar opposites at the moment, do you have any idea how the research that you're doing on Mr. Rasuli will factor into the court case? I have no idea at all. I mean, I wasn't involved in, in, in the court case. We saw Mr. Rasuli as part of our, our research program. Um, and in many ways, he was, he was very typical of, of, uh, of these patients in that he's an extremely complicated case. And, you know, this is, this is borne out in the media reports and in what we've seen uh, of the investigations that he's had so far, that um, sometimes he, he seems to have responses, sometimes he doesn't have responses. There's questions about exactly what his diagnosis is, whether he's vegetative or whether he was vegetative, whether he's minimally conscious. And I think this just illustrates how difficult these patients are. Severe brain injury produces a, you know, sometimes a very complicated pattern of responses and symptoms that's extremely difficult to unravel. And I haven't asked you this yet, but do you have a view on how you think the court should resolve that case? I, you know, I, obviously, I do. I, I think that. You want to tell us? Well, <laughs> <laughs> I think everybody's opinions need to be taken into consideration. I think, you know, we need a balanced view here. It isn't. It is important that we have the dialogue. I think that uh, the patient's prior wishes need to be um, taken account. Do of. Do we know what those were? Uh, I don't know what they are in this particular case, but in, in most situations we rely on the, the, family, the family members or the person acting on behalf of the family to indicate what those wishes are most likely to have been. But also we need to take into account medical opinion, the likelihood of recovery, and you know I, I think a balanced view is what we need. And we need to remember that every case is different. We can't have one law that applies to everybody because there will always be a case that doesn't fit the model. Okay, you've really skillfully dodged the question here though, which is do you have a view on how the case ought to be resolved? No, I don't. In Rasuli? In this particular case, I, I think that's not a view for me. That's something that the courts need to decide. Fair enough. Let me get in our last few minutes here into some of the ethics around all of this, because um, 
Communicating with people in a vegetative state opens up a lot of ethical questions, and I wonder if you could tell us how you feel your research will help deal with some of the ethics around all of this. Well, I think one of the important things is that we understand exactly what situation each patient is in. That's a, that's a difficult uh, ethical decision, and uh, it's a difficult ethical situation. Um, knowing whether a patient has no residual consciousness or whether they, they are aware, and even the extreme view is they're completely aware of everything going on around them. We really need to nail that down as best we can in every patient. So the research that I'm involved with would, would definitely have an impact on that. I think we can improve diagnosis. Uh, prognosis, I think we can improve too. I think there's early evidence that the imaging findings are helping us to be able to tell which patients are likely to go on to have some level of recovery and, and, and who isn't going to have any recovery. And I think that will be important for deciding how we should um, assign resources and how decisions are made about, about particular patients. Well, that was the next thing I was going to get to. We, we do spend, I think, almost $48 billion a year in Ontario on health care, which seems like an enormous sum of money. But, of course, uh, it's never enough, and you could probably spend double tomorrow if you wanted to. So I guess part of the question around all this becomes, if we're spending finite resources on this with, at the moment, maybe not as much payback or payoff as you would like to see, are we you know, risking not funding something else that may have better payoff for us sooner? I don't know. What do you think? I think that's likely to be the case. I mean, it's always true that there are finite resources. Mm -hmm. I think one of the problems in this particular area is that people often get very distracted by so-called miracle cases, patients that, that recover from comas after several years, these sorts of things. And, you know, we have to be sensible about this and we have to do this probabilistically. And, you know, even though very occasionally some of these patients might recover, um, I think we have to look at every case. We have to learn as much as we can about every case and decide, as you say, whether there is sufficient reason to direct resources at, at each uh, you know, individual case because it's never going to be possible to... Uh, you know, we will always be spreading things too thinly if we apply the same rule to everybody. W w do you want to make the case here about on why you think this money is well spent on this project as opposed to on something else? Absolutely. I think, I think we've made phenomenal progress. I think the uh, identifying consciousness in patients who were previously thought to be vegetated, or in, in some patients, I should be, should be absolutely clear, it's not all patients, um, I think is a tremendously important clinical application for a what is basically a research technique, fMRI, and I think it's a, it's a very good example of where basic science can have a direct impact on clinical uh, evaluation, diagnosis, and prognosis. Uh, I, don't, I don't think many people are arguing that we, we've been so spectacularly successful in that respect. In our last minute here, let me finish on something right out of left field, which is if this fMRI can help unlock information that is locked inside somebody who cannot communicate in any other way other than by uh, brain activity. Could the same technology be used to read the true thoughts of an otherwise healthy person as a kind of a sophisticated lie detector, for example? That's a, that's a really interesting question. It's certainly the direction that many people are trying to push this field. But I think it's very important to understand exactly where the technology is. So, so right now, I, I could put you in our scanner, and I could ask you to do one of, of two things, play tennis or move around your house. And very accurately, I think I could tell which of those two things you are doing. But that's not the same as you lying in the scanner and deciding to think anything mm -hmm. and me being able to decode those thoughts. That's a much, much bigger problem. And that's the problem you have with things like lie detection, is that the person can be doing, having random thoughts in the scanner and, and decoding those thoughts, truly mind reading. We're still really quite a long way away from doing that. So uh, I can't use this technique to find out what your favorite football team in England is. You could certainly try, but I think you'll fail. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Adrian Owen, uh, good of you to visit us at TVO again and continued success with your work, we hope. My pleasure. Thank you very much. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at TVO.org.